welcome to our Bible study session this evening, which is on the fifth week of Lent. We're focusing on the St. John's Gospel on the raising of Lazarus. And as we always do, let's begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray together the words and the prayer our Lord himself taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Every week we start our Bible study session by looking back at the Gospel of the previous Sunday. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. There was a man named Lazarus who lived in the village of Bethany with the two sisters Mary and Martha, and he was ill. It was the same Mary, the sister of the sick man Lazarus, who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair. The sisters sent this message to Jesus, Lord, the man you love is ill. On receiving the message, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death, but in God's glory, and through it the Son of God will be glorified. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, yet when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed where he was for two more days, before saying to the disciples, Let us go to Judea. The disciples said, Rabbi, it is not long since the Jews wanted to stone you. Are you going back again? Jesus replied, Are there not twelve hours in the day? A man can walk in the daytime without stumbling, because he has the light of this world to see by. But if he walks at night he stumbles, because there is no light to guide him. He said that, and then added, Our friend Lazarus is resting. I am going to wake him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he is able to rest, he is sure to get better. The phrase Jesus used referred to the death of Lazarus, but they thought that by rest he meant sleep. So Jesus put it plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I am glad I was not there, because now you will believe, but let us go to him. Then Thomas, known as the twin, said to the other disciples, Let us go too and die with him. On arriving, Jesus found that Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days already, Bethany is only about two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to sympathise with them over their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus had come, she went out to meet him. Mary remained sitting in the house. Martha said to Jesus, If you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now whatever you ask of God he will grant you. Your brother, said Jesus to her, will rise again. Martha said, I know he will rise again at the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. If anyone believes in me, even though he dies, he will live. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she said. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, the one who was to come into this world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in a low voice, The Master is here, and wants to see you. Hearing this, Mary got up quickly and went to him. Jesus had not yet come into the village. He was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were in the house sympathising with Mary saw her get up so quickly and go out, they followed her, thinking that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Mary went to Jesus, and as soon as she saw him, she threw herself at his feet, saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. At the sight of her tears, and those of the Jews who followed her, Jesus said in great distress, with a sigh that came straight from the heart, Where have you put him? They said, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. 
and the Jews said, See how much he loved him. But there were some who remarked, He opened the eyes of the blind man. Could he not have prevented this man's death? Still sighing, Jesus reached the tomb. It was a cave with a stone to close the opening. Jesus said, Take the stone away. Martha said to him, Lord, by now he will smell. This is the fourth day. Jesus replied, Have I not told you that if you believe you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you for hearing my prayer. I knew indeed that you always hear me, but I speak for the sake of all these who stand round me, so that they may believe it was you who sent me. When he had said this, he cried in a loud voice, Lazarus, hear, come out. The dead man came out, his feet and hands bound with bands of stuff and a cloth round his face. Jesus said to them, Unbind him, let him go free. Many of the Jews had, who had come to visit Mary had seen what he did and believed in him. The Gospel of the Lord. We have another fascinating gospel this week, another really long gospel from St. John. As I said last week, if you looked at last week's video, throughout year A we're reading a Matthew's gospel, focusing mainly on Matthew. But these last three weeks we've been reading John and we've been focusing on three important steps. Each one, the lectionary compilers, the people who put together our readings every week, are trying to emphasise something different and something important. Two weeks ago, we had the Samaritan woman at the well, and we had our Lord proclaiming that he is the living water. Last week, we had the man born blind, which you can watch the video on, on our channel here. And in that video, and in that gospel, we're discussing Jesus as the light of the world, the light of faith that allows the blind man to see again. And as he begins to come to terms with that, here we have another great affirmation. I am the resurrection and the life. Those three things are building as we go. We're moving toward Easter. Easter's two weeks from now. So this week, as we begin a season in the old calendar called Passion Tide, so you'll notice if you're looking at live streams from churches, and if you look at the live, at the videos of masses in the chaplain, here at the chaplaincy, the statues are veiled, so they're covered, because we're now focusing in on what's happening at Easter on those moments there at Easter. So there's kind of a focusing in on the passion that we're going to have in Holy Week next week. And this coming Sunday, of course, is Palm Sunday, so there's that shift as well. But in this particular way, we're actually prefiguring, we're foreshadowing those three important elements of Easter. Water, the living water, the waters of baptism. In normal years, lots of catechumens, people preparing to become Christians would be baptised and received into the church or at the Easter Vigil. This is not normal times, that might not be happening this year. But the symbolism of baptism and the Easter Vigil, that great evening, the greatest of all vigils, we renew our baptismal promises. And so we've got that symbolism right there. Last week, the light of the world, the light of Christ in the world, the Paschal Candle, that's the symbolism right there, the Paschal Candle the light of Christ illuminating a pitch black church, a dark world. And if you watched, as I did, and as many other people did, about 11 million people around the world did, that great Orbi et Orbi blessing by Pope Francis in an empty St. Peter's Square was a light in the darkness, very literally. And it's a wonderful foreshadowing of what we're gonna see at the Easter Vigil. This week, we have the even greater, we're kind of building as we go, the resurrection and the life. What do we mean by that? Well, the resurrection and the life, the new life that Christ offers through the cross, through his death on the cross, his victory over death on the cross, that's what we participate in, that's what we share in, in our baptism. And so that's where we're headed. We're kind of moving always in this direction. And we're moving toward that great season of Easter. We're moving toward that when we are living in the light of Christ, from the waters of baptism who is the resurrection and the life we're participating we're sharing in that so the lectionary compilers are kind of building us toward that great moment the night of nights that we're going to celebrate a week on saturday the night of nights 
the night when we recall the rising from the dead of our Lord himself. And in this gospel, it's full of symbolism pointing towards something that's not happened yet. Numerous places throughout this gospel, we're talking about things that haven't happened yet. And yet St. John, St. John, who's the latest of the gospel writers, is writing theology as well as writing a written account, which is why the written accounts are a little bit confusing at times. He's working toward that moment. He's working toward the resurrection. He's working toward the whole thrust of this gospel, the whole thrust of the Christian message, Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension into heaven, which we will participate in. His death through baptism and his resurrection in that baptismal life and through the sacraments through the church. So we're building toward those moments and we're seeing that so plainly here in this gospel. So where do we start? Well, unlike with the man born blind, Jesus was in Jerusalem. Jesus has gone back. He's gone home. He's gone to Transjordania. He's beyond. He's no longer in Jerusalem. He is no longer there. And what John does at the beginning of this gospel is he introduces us to friends of Jesus. That doesn't seem particularly significant, but it actually is significant. These are people who are named beyond the twelve, beyond his immediate disciples. These aren't disciples who are following him around. These are people who are static. They're his friends. And we introduce to Lazarus, Mary and Martha. Now we know Mary and Martha from the other Gospels. We know them from um, Mark's Gospel when Jesus is staying with Mary and Martha and we have this interesting encounter where Martha's doing all the work and Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus and Jesus says Marth Mary has took the better part because she's sitting, she's listening at the feet of the teacher. That's this Mary and Martha, that's who we're talking about. But John adds a very interesting point in the second verse of this chapter. So this is the beginning of a new chapter, chapter 11. This is the beginning of a new chapter. He's crossed the Jordan, so he's on the other side of the Jordan. But Mary and Martha, it was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with his hair, her hair. If you read John's Gospel, she hasn't done that yet. She hasn't done that. This is something that's going to happen after this event because Jesus is going to stay in Bethany with Mary, Martha and Lazarus and that's when they're going to do this moment. The anointing with precious oil, ointment, smelling fragrant smells that you would use for funerals and wiping his feet with her hair. That has not happened yet. So it's an interesting detail that John's putting in before the actual event and if you're reading this chron chronologically, if you're reading this from one chapter, first chapter of John, all the way through. This doesn't make any sense. Why is he? Why is John making this point? Why is he saying that? What he's doing, what he's showing, is the closeness of this family to Jesus. Lazarus and Jesus are very good friends. Mary and Martha and Jesus and Lazarus are friends. Whenever Jesus visits the temple, we can infer that he stops in Bethany on his way back. And that makes quite a lot of sense because Bethany is heading down along the path that you would take between Galilee and Jerusalem. You wouldn't go through Samaria, you would go from Galilee to Jerusalem, you'd follow the Jordan, you'd follow the Jordan bank, you would come through Jericho, and then you'd come up to Bethany, stay in Bethany, and then head on to Jerusalem. And you'd come across the Mount of Olives on your way into Jerusalem. That would be the way a Jew would come if you're coming from Galilee. That's the way you'd go. That's the way Jesus would go. And so he stops and stays in Bethany, Bethany and he knows Mary, Martha and Lazarus and he knows them well. And so what they do is they immediately, sorry my, my Bible's down here, they immediately send message to Jesus. Lazarus is ill. What are they hoping for? that Jesus will come straight away and heal Lazarus. Now consider, if Jesus is in Transjordania, he's on the other side of the Jordan, how is he gonna get there quickly? It's a remarkable amount of faith, really, that they're putting in. They're expecting Jesus to kind of rush to Lazarus's aid and raise him from this illness, to kind of heal him. But it's a long way. But John kind of compounds the whole issue. Consider, when they send this message, Jesus doesn't go straight away. 
In fact, John specifically says that he waits two more days. What would be our expectation? That we pray to Jesus and that he immediately rushes to our aid, heals us, saves us, brings us back to that wonderful place where we were. But he doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. Why? Why doesn't he do that? And it can seem astonishing. If you have, say, a friend of yours, I mean, outside the current climate, but a friend of yours says that they're in hospital or that somebody you love is in hospital, what do you do? You rush down to the hospital to see if they're okay. Say someone was in A&E, you're gonna be there at A&E quickly in order to see, are they okay? Is there something wrong? Can I help? Jesus doesn't. And that's quite puzzling. But what I want you to do is I want you to think back to the man born blind. Think back to the man born blind. The disciples are questioning Jesus. Who sinned, this man or his parents? Remember that? How did Jesus respond? He said, well, he's like this so that God's glory can be performed. Hear the echo in that in verse four of this gospel. The illness is not the, this illness is not to end in death, but is for the glory of God. John is showing a deliberate parallel between these two occasions, the man born blind and the raising of Lazarus, that he's doing it so that the glory of God may be revealed. And so what he's saying is that our suffering and death isn't meaningless. We often want to think it is, we often want to think it's a punishment, but it's not meaningless. Suffering God can actually use for his purposes. Sin, in a way, God can use for his purposes. God doesn't create the sin. God is not the root nor the cause of the sin. The sin is normally freely perpetrated by us or is a consequence of original sin. But he uses it. He uses it in order to create some, so that some greater glory may be seen, a greater glory may be shown. And so when we see it through that way, we remember that God still has a plan. That plan's hidden from us, yeah, but he still has it. He still has it. And this, John's kind of hinting at, is showing that. Is showing that. So after two days, Jesus and the disciples are going to head off to Judea. Let's go back to Judea. Now consider, you're the disciples, you've seen. The last time Jesus was in Jerusalem, do you remember? At the end of chapter 8, they were going to stone him. They were going to kill him. And curing the man born blind and the whole Pharisee debacle and this man as a sinner hasn't helped matters. They were going to kill him. Jesus' life is on the line. And if you're a disciple, if you're one of the apostles and you're seeing that, what? What do you mean? You're crazy. We should stay well away from that. These events are happening in reasonably rapid succession. There's not huge spans of time and not years between these events days, weeks, months at best. Why would he do that? Why would he go? So they're reminding him that the Jews wanted to stone you. And then Jesus answers with this really interesting um, explanation. He says, well, you know, there are 12 hours in the day. Now consider you have a friend who is saying that he wants to go to a situation where he could be killed. You've told him, are you crazy? And then he responds, well, there are 12 hours in the day and that we can walk in the daylight because we can see by the light of the sun, which you can see streaming through my window, which is why the lighting shifts quite a lot. You can see, you don't stumble, you can walk, you can do everything in the light of the day. At night, you stumble and you fall. Okay, but what do you mean? What he means is, he is the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. We've heard that last time, last week, man born blind. I am the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. He is the light by which we can see. Unlike the sun that sets, 
His light will never set. His night will never diminish and will never stop. And if we turn in the direction of the light, we can see. Consider, if you are in a room and you have a torch and you're fumbling, maybe the lights have gone out and you're trying to get to the fuse box, you've got a torch. Okay, where do you shine the torch? Well, you shine it where you're meant to be looking. Because if you don't, you stumble, you fall over. You don't shine it behind you, that's useless. You don't shine it to a different direction. Again, equally useless. You might get some reflected light, but it's not the same. You have the light in the direction that you're going. You need the light to see by. Without that light, you're useless. At night time, without your lights on, you can't see anything. Jesus is that, but to a much greater degree, because he is the light which illuminates the path to God. He shows us how we should live, what we should do. Without him, we're going to stumble, like the people at night. We're going to stumble. And what he's doing is he's showing that we need to see, we need to go along the right path. And if he doesn't show the path, we're in much greater danger. Like those without light, if they don't have light, they're in danger of stumbling, falling, and horrible things can happen to you. If you're walking around upstairs at night, you can very easily fall down the stairs and end up in hospital, and horrible things can happen to you. Greater things than our Lord's life are at risk here. That's what our Lord is saying. And he's really kind of showing us that. He's really pointing us in that direction. And so we're kind of hearing an echo of what we hear in the last chapter of John, which we haven't read in this succession, which is in between the man born blind and this session section, which is the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Jesus knows that he has to confront this danger confront the danger to help Lazarus. And he does, and he willingly does. He wants to confront this danger. And what he's doing, John is showing, is he's foreshadowing the cross. He's foreshadowing the cross. He's showing that he will do these things to save someone. He will do the cross in order to save us all, every single one of us. So he's already showing that. And then our Lord gives this kind of interesting kind of suggestion about Lazarus resting, resting, sleeping. And we find this again in Thessalonians, Paul's letters of the Thessalonians, when he talks about those who are sleeping in Christ. The word he uses is chimeteron. Chimeteron is where we get the word cemetery from. It's a place where people sleep, a place where people rest, the cemetery. So there's actually a very interesting link there between what we talk about as a cemetery and if you go to a cemetery and resting, waiting for the resurrection. It's talking about Lazarus being asleep and the disciples miss this completely because to talk about sleep and death is actually a pretty common thing. We talk about it as well when we say someone will rest in peace, rest in peace. We're not kind of thinking that they're going to sit up with their feet up in fluffy clouds but that they're kind of a fully aliveness in that resting, but there is no concern, no worry, which is peaceful, peaceful light, sleep. There's that link there between resting and sleep. So in biblical language, it's a very often used as a metaphor for death, and that's precisely what's being used for here. That's what Jesus is using it for here. But he then says, we're gonna go awaken him. It's very interesting that the word to awaken in Mark's Gospel is exactly the same word that he uses for the resurrection. It's the same word. To awaken, to resurrect. We awake from our sinful, our death to life. We can often think about death is an almost a semi, is almost like, um, sleep is almost like death in many ways if you think about it. Um, you're not conscious, if you're not awake. Anything could happen to you. It's a very trusting state to be in. Anything could happen to you. But you can't respond. So too with death. You can't respond. You're not conscious. And so there's actually a very strong link between those two things. And because the link is so strong, um, and the metaphor is actually very good, the disciples miss the point completely. They say, oh, well, if he's resting, he's going to get better. Well, think about it. When someone is ill, 
oh, go, go sleep it off. You know, when someone's got a headache, go sleep it off. Or when someone's in the hospital, they spend a lot of time sleeping and resting. We talk about this a lot, that you've got to rest. Well, this is exactly what they're suggesting. If he's going to rest, he's going to get better. We don't need to rush. What's the point? Well, there's no need to rush. Let's not go to Judea now. It's not safe. But Jesus then says, look, Lazarus is dead. Lazarus is dead. And that's what I'm talking about. Consider, though, no one has told him. John doesn't record a messenger saying, Lazarus has died. He doesn't say that. How does he know? He knows because he is the incarnate word of God. He is God himself. He knows. He knows that Lazarus is dead because he knows what is required, what he's going to do to perform this greatest of the signs. This entire section in John's gospel is called the book of signs. We often refer to it as the book of signs. And each one is kind of increasing and growing in magnitude. It starts with the wedding feast at Cana, water into wine. The sign, the miracle that everybody hopes that any priest can perform. I hate to inform you, we really can't. But the water and the wine, the first of the signs. This is the last of the signs, and it is the greatest. Arguable point if you like a good party, but it is the greatest of the signs. So, he is showing something. He is leading us to something. It is God incarnate, fully man, fully God, incarnational. John loves the incarnation. In the beginning was the word, and the word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. John is a big proponent of expressing the theology around the incarnation, fully God, fully man. These debates would rage in the church for quite some time in the fourth century because of someone called Arius who was trying to deny the divinity of Jesus, which is why we get the creed, the creed that we say every Sunday. Bit of a side point, but important. These questions and debates have been around in the church from the earliest days, and John, right at the very beginning, is saying, no, he is God and man, fully God, fully man. And so we're seeing his divinity coming out in this particular moment. And so what we're saying, what the healing, this curing, the saving has to be done because Lazarus has died. The incarnate word knows what he needs to do for his mission. But then he ends with this really weird phrase. I'm glad for you I wasn't there. I'm glad for you I wasn't there. Think about it. Jesus is glad he wasn't there when his friend is dying or died? Very weird. Why is he glad? He's glad because the miracle, the sign is all the greater with the time. Because it's not just like it's a very serious illness that mimics death and then he'll get back up anyway, and that's what Jesus is doing, isn't really something very miraculous. No, he's saying that because now it's greater. People don't die for four days and just get back up again. It's greater, and it's a demonstrative, demonstrative, should I say, moment for the apostles. I'm glad for your sake that I'm not there. I'm glad for you that I was not there, so that you may believe. To see and believe, wonderful theme in John, see about again last week, wonderful theme from John. To see is to believe. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed is even greater, but to see who Jesus is and not believe, greatest of the sins. And so they're gonna head back to the danger in Jerusalem, to Judea. Thomas, Thomas who gets a horrible rap in, in, this, in these gospels, doubting Thomas, Thomas the twin, he is the one who says, let us go and die with Jesus. Let us go and die together. Interesting how this thought doesn't stay with the disciples long. Consider, when Jesus is arrested, they all run away except for the beloved disciple, John. They all run away. It's Thomas who doubts the existence of the resurrected Jesus. Surely you're just seeing this image. But it's Thomas here who affirms, let's die together. Let's go together. It's a great moment of great courage that they're going to go through this, but that they want to follow the master. Never forget, they want to follow the master. The disciples throughout the gospels, they want to follow Jesus. Same with us. We want to follow Jesus. It's our human weakness that lets us down. 
It's our human frailties, our fears, our worries, our concerns, particularly in this present moment, that let us down. Jesus is the way, the truth and life, the path that we should follow. Be like Thomas, be like Thomas. And so they near the outskirts of Bethany and they find out that Lazarus has been in the tomb four days. Notice here the description of the tomb when we're going to get to it. Notice the description of the tomb parallels the description in the Synoptic Gospels of the tomb of Jesus. A cave that is carved out with a stone over the entrance. That should be ringing bells in our minds and our, when we hear these words, we should be thinking, the tomb of Jesus, the tomb of Jesus, seeing those links together. That's what we should be thinking, that's what we should be looking at. Now, ancient Jewish burial practices, ancient Jewish burial practices, the person dies, they are laid in a tomb and they should be buried on the same day. Why? Hot country, they're gonna start to smell very, very quickly. So they anoint them on the same day with oils that make them smell. They wash them, wrap them in burial clothes and put them in the tomb. They're processed into the tomb and the tomb is covered over. And then starts the day of mourning, the period of mourning, which is about seven days long. And we're coming in at this moment, four days in. What happens during this period? The family stays at home and mourners come to spend time with the family and mourn with the family. It's kind of a seven day wake would be kind of our equivalent now, a seven day long wake and that you would come and visit them. And the bodies would be wrapped in burial clothes, a cloth would cover their face. It's similar to mummification in Egypt without the removal of the organs, the bodies remain intact. After about a year, so the period of mourning really goes on for about a year. After about a year, what they do is that the flesh is completely decomposed, it's just bones remain. They come, they collect the bones, they put them into an ossuary, a kind of a container for the bones and store them in this ossuary. And so the tomb can be reused again and again and again and again and again. It's a very weird thing, not something that kind of sits well with us, but this is ancient Jewish practices. So we're coming into this scene four days into this morning. Lazarus has died, been buried on the same day, and now we're four days in. So the morning is happening at Mary and Martha and Lazarus's house. That's why the Jews are there coming to greet them. We have this interesting detail as well that we're very, very close to Jerusalem. So the danger is real, very, very present. And so another ancient tradition within the Jewish um, mindset, which we should consider, is the speculation that the spirit of the deceased left the burial area after three days. After three days, the spirit of the person has gone, just the body remains. So we're four days in, even more significant than that. Also notice here the parallels, at least partly, with the resurrection of our Lord, three days in the tomb. Lazarus is four. Our resurrection is showing that this resurrection is different from the resurrection of our Lord after his crucifixion. The resurrection of our Lord after his crucifixion is greater because it is the life-giving permanent resurrection. Lazarus will die again. So John is showing similarities but differences at this very point. And so what we're seeing here is something really significant. What we're seeing here is something really significant. The Jews are coming to spend time with Martha and Mary, seven days of mourning, four days in, coming to spend the time. Notice how the reaction of the Jews changes when they see what the Lord does. So chapter 11 unfolds as Jesus is moving closer and closer to Lazarus's tomb. There's kind of a sense of urgency, but also a kind of tension, kind of what's going to happen? What's going to happen? What's going to happen? Notice too that in John's gospel, this is his path, his ultimate final path to Jerusalem. This is Jesus turning toward the cross. It's significant. This greatest of the signs is the last thing he does before the beginning toward Jerusalem, the cross, his death, the passion and his resurrection. It's all leading up. There's the movement of the gospel. It's all leading in this direction. Jesus is about to confront the enemy, death, which he will confront in the ultimate way on the cross. This is the first battle with death and his first victory over death. 
And so we're moving toward that. We're slowly moving in that direction. Martha and Mary, notice here, when Jesus arrives in Bethany, he's on the outskirts of Bethany, Martha runs out to meet Jesus. Mary stays put. This should remind us of Luke's gospel. Martha and Mary at the, Martha doing all the work, Mary staying at Jesus' feet. Mary stays put, Martha goes out and does the work. They're in the exact same way that we find in Luke 10, verses 38 to 42. Martha doing the work, Mary staying put. She runs out to meet Jesus. When she meets Jesus, we have this question, this, this kind of statement, Lord, if you had been here, Lord, if you'd been here. She thought that she has a trust that Jesus can perform miracles and heal people. Lord, if you'd been here, this could have happened. My brother would not have died. Lazarus was sick when they sent the messengers out. That's what she was hoping for. But Lazarus has died. However, she has this kind of affirmation. There's still an affirmation in Jesus' power to heal. Even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. There's still an affirmation of his power. And Jesus gives this response. Your brother will rise. Four days in, spirit already gone. Four days in in the morning. What? He's dead. It doesn't happen. We don't see dead people walking down the streets. It's not like the walking dead. It's not a zombie. You don't see that. What do you mean? And this is where Jesus then responds to Martha with the fifth and perhaps greatest I am statement. The I am statements are very famous in John's gospel. He uses the words in Greek, ego emi, which are the same words used in the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Old Testament, which God uses, I am who I am. Ego emi, Jesus is using them as well. Great power in the words, I am, I am. Great power in those words because they're the words of God, I am. And he uses this phrase, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, consider to the Jewish mindset, the resurrection, there is a widely held belief, particularly with the Pharisees, not with the Sadducees. The Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. That's why they're sad, you see. That's how you remember who they are. They are sad, you see. No resurrection. But the Pharisees do. And lots of Jews do believe. It's a kind of a divine justice sort of tradition. That if your life sucks in this life, the Lord will raise you from the dead and life will be brilliant with God. So there is this belief. And that's what Martha expressed. Well, yeah, at the end of time, he will rise from the dead, of course. Jesus says, no, 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 no. That this is happening now. And that he is the life. Because in the waters of baptism, we have that new life. We are sharing in that. And so we're seeing a kind of an element of that. But notice as well, as with the formerly blind man, Jesus asks the question, do you believe? Do you believe? With the blind man, do you believe in the Son of Man? Here, do you believe this? Do you believe this? And Mary here gives a great affirmation of faith, just like Peter does at Caesarea Philippi. Yes, Lord, I have come to believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who is coming into the world. That you are coming into the world, yeah? And so we're seeing that moment happening. That this is the Son of God, that this is all happening. And this is the title of God, Son of God. This is the title that's coming out here. And so this is kind of what we see on the creed. I believe in the resurrection from the a resurrection of the body we say that in the creed every time we remove because god removes death he removes the fear of death he removes the sadness of death because he's the resurrection and the life and he makes it able there for us to be more diligent to good works and draw away from evil these are the definitions that saint thomas aquinas gives on reflecting on the resurrection so jesus is outside the village martha has met jesus martha sends words to, to mary come 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 on Come, it's the master. Come be with him. Mary hears this, rises quickly, goes out to meet him. The Jews think she's going to the tomb to weep and wail at the tomb. He's long dead in their minds. He's coming to weep and wail at the tomb. She sees Jesus. She falls at his feet. This is what we're going to see later on. This element from John that he said about anointing the feet and wiping them with her hair, which we're actually going to find later out in the, on in this chapter. John's time traveling a little bit. But she falls at his feet exactly the same way, exactly the same way. 
And she says those same questions, Lord, if only you'd been here. And what we see here, how much Jesus loved this family, what we see here is a personification, an example of the sacred heart of Jesus. That great devotion that Jesus weeps from his heart for his people who are in pain and suffering. The Lord weeps. And this is actually one of the most beautiful gospels and I recommend this gospel actually if you're having a funeral. Okay, priests, I'm gonna say this now, this is gonna be completely open and honest, this is kind of in, parent, in brackets, this is outside Bible study. When you do a funeral, speaking as a priest, please, please, please don't always pick, there are many rooms in my father's house. It's a beautiful gospel, don't get me wrong, it speaks to a lot of people, it's very, very important. But every funeral a priest does, seemingly, I've only been a priest a very short time, but most funerals I do, that's the gospel reading. And there are so many, so many ways that you can talk about it as a priest before you kind of want a bit of variety. This gospel is one of the options you can choose. One of the options you can choose, why? Because see Jesus' reaction. Jesus weeps for Lazarus. Even Jesus felt the pain of separation of death. He saw that. As much as we feel that, Jesus saw that and he weeps. And a sigh that comes straight from his heart, the sacred heart of Jesus. He knows that pain and he raises us to new life. Beautiful, beautiful gospel. Consider it for a funeral. There's so much a priest can say and he will thank you. He'll never say it, but he'll thank you for at least a bit of variety with gospels. Close bracket. Back down to this gospel. Jesus is perturbed, he's troubled, he's worried, he's concerned, he's agitated, I think would probably be a better way to describe it, he's agitated by this whole thing. As much as we're worked up and agitated when someone dies, the whole flurry around a funeral, and preparing a funeral, we're agitated, we're antsy, we can't sleep, we can't, that's what Jesus is feeling at this moment. This is his humanity really coming out, fully man, fully God, this is really coming out very, very strongly. And, and we see the same sort of thing at the hour of his death. He's troubled, he's agitated when he knows that someone is going to betray him. And in the agony in the garden, he's worried, he's agitated. It's the same sort of belief here. Jesus then asks, where is the tomb? Come and see. Interesting. This is the response that Jesus gives when after John the Baptist says, behold the Lamb of God, and two of John the Baptist's disciples follow him, Andrew being one of them, the brother of Peter, one of Jesus' is twelve, they say, Master, where do you live? What does he respond? Come and see. Come and see. So there's wonderful parallelism there between the calling of the disciples and coming to the tomb to be raised a new life. There's wonderful, wonderful symbolism there. Don't forget that. But we see Jesus' grief so plainly and so openly on display that even the Jews remark, see how much he loved this man. That's what Jesus feels to each of us. See how much he loves you. It's exactly the same. And then, could, could not one who opened the eyes of the blind man do the same for this man? Blind man, last Sunday's gospel. They knew that because these are the Jews who were in the area who saw him heal the blind man. Could he not have done this? Now the question in Greek is kind of begging uh, an affirmative response. You know, we're saying, didn't I see you the other day? You're kind of expecting someone to say, yeah, yeah, you saw me, yeah. It's kind of begging a yes response. And that's what the Greek is kind of suggesting. What they're implying is they have a belief that Jesus can perform amazing things because they've seen it with the blind man. They're expecting him to perform amazing things. And so we're seeing that Jesus has the high priest, has the same emotions and sadnesses that we feel in when someone dies comes to the tomb he's exactly as distressed and discerning again the description of the tomb here the alarm bell should be, the, the bell should be ringing in our heads this echoes the description of the tomb of Jesus in the synoptic gospels even then Jesus then says command that the stone is, ro the stone is rolled away Easter stone rolled away again see the connection see the alarm bells Martha who's had this great affirmation of faith suddenly has this doubt that Lord he'll stink Bodies smell when someone dies. They really do smell, particularly in hot climates, particularly in those sorts of places. There's an element of doubt, but they're emphasizing that Lazarus is indisputably dead. He's dead, yeah? He's as dead as a doornail. He is an ex-parrot, sort of. 
the dead parrot sketch from Monty Python. The body's already decomposing. We know this, Genesis 3.19, we talk about the decomposing of the body. It's the result of original sin, it's the result of death. But she doesn't fully understand what Jesus is saying when he says, I'm the resurrection and the life. So she's still a bit of doubt. And so Jesus reaffirms, yeah, he's dead, but God's glory is gonna be performed. Man born blind, that the glory of God is gonna be performed. The beginning of this gospel, that the glory of God may be performed. And he's gonna transform Lazarus' death to a wonderful sign. And that's what we're seeing here. If you believe, you will see. Faith enables believers to see God manifest in Jesus' signs. And this inspires St. Augustine when he's re referencing on Isaiah 7, 9. We believe in order to understand. We have to believe in order to understand. Understanding comes later, but belief comes first. So they do what Jesus has said. And now here we have a snapshot into the inner communication of the Trinity. This is rare, the inner communication of the Trinity, the prayers between Jesus and the Father with the Holy Spirit. This is rare. Why? Because Jesus often goes to a quiet place and a lonely place to pray. Internal communication of the Trinity. But we're seeing it openly and displayed. And we're seeing it because Jesus wants us to see it. He wants us to know what is going on here. I know you always hear me. There's always that inner connection within the Trinity. And that and by doing that, by doing this miracle, by doing this sign, he will reveal God's divine presence so that the crowd may believe that it is the Father who sent the Son so that we may have life and have it to the full. And Jesus then cries out loudly, Lazarus, come out. Regarding the power of death, notice here, he is still bound. He is still bound. The voice, the Son's voice is crying out we're hearing an echo of this chapter 5 verses 28 to 29 the hour is coming in which all in their tombs will hear my voice and will come out to the resurrection paraphrased admittedly they hear the voice and he comes out notice it is God's power that raises him he's not raised himself why he is still bound by the funeral clothes when Jesus is resurrected from the tomb what happens to the funeral clothes they are laid neatly and the cloth is laid neatly at the foot of the tomb Jesus raises, is raised the Trinity. God raises himself, but God has to raise us. We can't do it of our own accord. It's a resurrection, not a resuscitation. We've not kind of done CPR and he's come back to life. It's a resurrection. And what does Jesus say? Untie him, let him go free. This is why St. Augustine says that this gospel is a beautiful symbolism of our um, moments of sin and the beauty of reconciliation of penance. Because... In the same way our sins are unbound, like the funeral cloths are unbound and we come back to life. We were dead to sin, we are now alive to Christ after we've gone to confession. Admittedly very difficult in these present circumstances. But Jesus has raised Lazarus up, we are raised up in reconciliation. The beautiful symbolism there and I think Augustine really does have a very beautiful, very important point. But notice, this resurrection is a foreshadowing of the resurrection of the Lord. There is no doubt in that and John is deliberately showing that. This is the greatest of the signs which is then shown in the greatest of the works which is the resurrection on, from the dead. His death on the cross and his resurrection on Easter. Death where is your victory? Death where is your sting? But Lazarus will die again. When he raised the son of the widow of Nain in Luke's gospel he's gonna die again. Jairus' daughter in Mark's gospel, going to die again. Those revived by God's power through the prophets Elijah and Elisha in the Old Testament in Kings 1 and 2, they're going to die again. But what he's showing here is a foretaste, like the transfiguration, it's a foretaste of what is to come. That it grows and increases with the beautiful combination that is the true abiding resurrection that can only come after our Lord's death. St Paul writes in Romans, Christ raised from the dead, dies no more, death no longer has power over him. That's its fullness, that's its beautiful fullness. And so the raising of Lazarus is the sign of Jesus' public ministry and Jesus himself, it prompts different responses because many of the Jews who come with Mary and saw the sign believed in him like they did with the blind man saw and they believe 
But not in this gospel, but what immediately happens after that, the Pharisees begin plotting the death of Jesus. Our Lord divides people. He divides people because the truth always does that. Consider the truth when we understand the truth and not your truth, my truth, nonsense, pull the other one, a load of tosh, ignore it. All this kind of um, relativistic truth, nonsense, it is nonsense of the highest order. And I cannot stress that enough. There is truth and then there is opinion and belief of certain things, not true belief, but belief in certain things. Um, but there is opinion. And then there is truth. But the truth will always divide people. Because the truth confronts us with the reality of how things are. And we can very easily say, I don't want it to be that case or I want it to be this case. And so the truth hurts us and we run and we turn away from the truth. And we lie to ourselves because the truth confronts us with these lies that we tell ourselves. Jesus is the truth and he's confronting the Pharisees with the lies that they've told themselves that they are the only ones who are connected with God. Jesus is showing that is not the truth. The truth is that God has been made flesh and he comes to meet us and encounter us and he did in the most beautiful way in the Gospels and we see that in the Gospels. But what he's showing is that the truth sets us free. Jesus himself tells us in John's Gospel, I am the way, the truth and the life. The truth sets us free because we no longer live in a fantasy, illusion based world, but we live in the light, not in the darkness. So the truth of God confronts all these things and it makes us uncomfortable. It makes us uncomfortable. And the gospel, if the Gospel doesn't make you uncomfortable at moments, you're not reading it right. If what the church teaches and preaches doesn't make you uncomfortable at moments, you're not understanding it right. Why? Because it challenges us to be better. It challenges us to be greater. And it's meant to be. Like a parent loves a child, they challenge them to be better. They don't stick with them in a very basic level. Consider when a child's learning to talk and they make all those kind of really adorable but silly little mistakes about he dieted and all these sorts of things, you know, when they kind of put things into the tenses wrong or they use wrong words or they pronounce things wrong. It's lovely, it's adorable, but eventually you correct them. You don't want them to be like that for the rest of their lives. God's like that with us. He doesn't want us to make these silly mistakes again and again and again. He wants us to be better and wants us to grow. How you do that is you've got to correct people. And it makes us feel uncomfortable and nobody likes being corrected. Nobody likes being told when they've done something wrong. Who does? Who does like being when they're told something wrong? But that's the power of the truth. It, it's needed. It's necessary. It's what helps us grow, helps us develop, helps us live the life of Christ. To follow like the apostles did. To see who God really is. To see and believe. And we will understand over time. And then we'll grow in that. And that is the beauty. That is the power of the gospel. And don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Don't let anyone say you're fine just the way you are. Because I hate to break it to you, none of us are. Don't get me wrong, we are all beloved children of God. We are all loved by God. Every single one of us is a beloved child of God. And that will remain true no matter what you do. You're not perfect the way you are. None of us are. We all need to grow and develop and change and mature, both physically, mentally, but spiritually. Don't leave your faith as it was when you left primary school. You're not singing the same hymns you sang in primary school. Believe in the same things you believed in primary school. Grow, deepen, explore and understand your faith. Listen to the beauty that is music that the church has had from the beginning of the church through to the present day. Listen to it all, explore it all. Be universal, be Catholic. Experience the extraordinary form of the Mass and the ordinary form of the Mass. Experience the Mass in hundreds of different languages. Broaden your horizons 
and broaden your experience of the Lord. Look, you've got plenty of time now. Go on Amazon, go to Kindle or whatever ebook reader thing that you have. Download a spiritual classic. Read something like St. Augustine's The Confessions. A beautiful book. I mean, he says things like that we can all relate to in many different ways. Lord, make me chase, but just not yet. Yeah, Lord, make me chase, but just not yet. Oh, Lord, make, do this thing for me, but no, not yet. I'm not ready to let go of that. Explore these things. Listen to these things. Deepen your faith. Deepen your prayer life. Spend that time in front of your little prayer station that I hope you've all set up in your houses by now. Spend that time with the Lord. Deepen your faith. Encounter him who is truth. Feel uncomfortable about it at times. But grow. Grow. Because he is the resurrection and the life and nothing else in your lives will offer you what he can offer you. Because he offers you eternal life. He offers you salvation. He's God. And he wants you to encounter him. And so that his glories may be shown in your life by how much some of us have changed. Encounter God. Listen to him speak to you. Listen to him who is truth. See and believe. And when you come to Easter, when we come to Easter, even though we're in our homes, celebrate and rejoice in the great gift he offers you. The great gift he offered you in baptism, the gift he continues to offer you through the church and the sacraments, that he offers you freely, openly and lovingly. Because you are a beloved child of God. And he would raise you from the grave. That is who he is. And he can be no other. He is the one who said, I am the resurrection.